Oh, you're asking if this is going to be on the exam? No, it's not. It's not going to be on the exam. But we kind of have to go a bit practically here. So we will start our discussion um, about the respiratory system with a description of its anatomy. So the main function of the respiratory system is to deliver oxygen from the outside world into the lungs and expel CO2 from the lungs into the outside world. And as you can imagine, in terms of the gas exchange in the lungs, there is a tight cooperation between the respiratory and the circulatory system. The entire respiratory system can be divided into two distinct anatomical parts. The respiratory zone, which is responsible for actual gas exchange, and the conducting zone, which is responsible for the gas transport. So the first structures of the respiratory system through which air, <coughs> sorry about that, thank you, air comes in the lungs. These structures are belonging to conducting zone. Nose with nasal cavities, nostrils, pharynx, trachea, the bronchi, well, they're not really shown here, but bronchi. These are all conducting structures. When air reaches the most terminally branched structures like respiratory bronchioles, alveolar ducts, and alveoli, this is the place where gas exchange occurred and those structures belong to respiratory zone. The process of Inhalation and exhalation is mediated by two muscles, well, two groups of muscles, diaphragm and intercostal muscles. And the process of getting the gas in and out of the lungs is called a pulmonary ventilation. Once the gas is in the lungs, say it's oxygen is in the lungs, it is picked up by the blood which transports oxygen to the tissues and then gas exchange in the tissues is called internal respiration while gas exchange in the lungs the gas exchange between alveoli of the lungs and the blood is called internal respiration so we basically can kind of highlight it this way that this part is ventilation this is external respiration I'm not going to put transport on here and then somewhere in the tissues gas exchange is called internal respiration so we're going to start the conversation of functional anatomy with a brief description of the nose the function to moisten and warm and clean the air, mechanically clean the air, to smell the smell, the olfaction, and it also changes the way your voice sounds, like you can clearly notice with me, I have some bit of a stuffy nose, so it's resonating channel. In the external nose, you can identify some pretty interesting anatomical details which you may not have been aware about so this is called a root in the bridge of the nose and this part is called dorsum nasi and the tip of the nose is technically an apex your nostril is called a nares and both nostrils are neri neri are separated by the cartilaginous septum and the the side structures of the nose I don't really know the English name for them. okay these are called ala 
of the nodes here. So these are L of the nodes. Moreover, I can tell you this, this groove between the nose and the upper leaf has its own anatomical term, which is filtrum. Exactly. Yes, it's filtrum. Um, now, if you would look inside of the nasal cavity here, there are certain parts that can be clear light identified. First roof. This is where olfactory epithelium is. It's formed by the ethmoid sphenoid bone. Roof of the nose basically separates the nasal cavity from cranial cavity, from the brain. The floor of the nasal cavity is formed by the hard palate, which is maxillary and palatine bones, and the soft palate. The part of the soft palate, as you can see here, is the uvula. We've learned about that part. The function of the uvula is to close the nasopharynx and nasal cavity when you swallow. Hair in the nose have really important function. They filter out the dust, the pollen, the mechanical debris. Now the nose is lined with pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. Now that means that there's not a lot of abrasion forces that your nasal cavity is exposed to, but presence of cilia suggests that nose produces a pretty significant amount of mucosal secretion, and that is actually true. Mucus, together with vibrisse, serves as the entrapment of the pathogens and dust and pollen, and movement of cilia move the mucus towards to the throat, to the pharynx, okay, where it can be swallowed. Does that make sense? Now, nose, as you know, can become obvious, a lot of sensory receptors. So when something considerably large lands on nasal mucosa, stimulation of the sensory receptors triggers sneeze. Okay, we're good. So, clears, moistens, uh, warms the air. Now, if you would look <coughs> inside of the nasal cavity, you will see that there are several folds that are called nasal concha. So, we've got a superior nasal concha, the middle nasal concha, and the inferior nasal concha. Nasal concha are separated by the nasal meati. So, essentially, all these fancy Greek and Latin words mean that you have three folds on the walls of the uh, nasal cavity. These folds are nasal concha, and these folds are separated by the grooves called meati. The function of these folds is to, of course, increase surface area, to increase the capacity of the nose to moisten and uh, moisten and warm up the air. They also increase the turbulence of the air in the nose, allowing to stay there for a longer time, which allows you to better humidify and warm up the air. Now, as you know, um, the recommendation is to breathe through your nose, not through your mouth. The reason for it is because nose will trap, well, nasal cavity, will be the first barrier for dust and pollen and stuff like that. It will be stuck in the mucus and moved back to your throat. That's one. Also, the air that enters your nasal cavity will be adjusted in terms of the temperature and humidity. Moreover, when you exhale through the nose, some of the temperature and humidity will be reclaimed 
Make sense? So you will have much less water loss if you exhale through the nose rather than through the mouth. There are several structures associated with the nasal cavity, so-called paranasal sinuses, which are responsible for the secretion of mucus um, and air humidification, and also they are important resonating chambers, the speech. This paranasal sinuses can be found in the maxillary bones, so on the sides of your nose, in the frontal bone, on top of your nose, and there are sinuses in the ethmoid, so that's sphenoid and that's ethmoid sinuses. So I cannot show them myself because they're too deep. Now, these cavities can get infected. And we call this infection sinusitis. If they get chronically infected, people develop chronic sinusitis, which is a pretty disturbing disease, um, as any inflammatory disease of the respiratory tract, it is characterized by the increased accumulation of mucus. This mucus either gets stuck in the sinuses, um, leading to headaches. Uh, it will also enter the nasal cavity, make up for runny nose. The treatment is usually uh, sinusitis is bacterial if it's chronic. can be fungal, but most often bacterial. can be treated with antibiotics in some severe cases with surgery. When doctor will go in and basically drain the pus and clean it up and prescribe a whole bunch of antibiotics to clear the infection. Uh, less disturbing, maybe, condition is called rhinitis, inflammation of the nasal mucosa. Okay? Does that make sense? So both sinusitis and rhinitis, especially if those are bacterial infections, are risk factors <clears throat> for developing either middle ear infection, as we will learn quickly soon, but you remember, your throat is connected to your middle ear, and migration of microorganisms from the throat into the middle ear can cause ear infection. Also, rhinitis and sinusitis, um, microorganisms that cause th those diseases, can actually enter your chest, leading to pneumonias. One of the common symptoms associated with sinusitis is the headache. And it turns out when sinuses are blocked by mucus, the air that is normally found there gets absorbed into the cells, which creates not exactly vacuum, I wouldn't call it a vacuum, it's not really vacuum, but decreased pressure. And that decreased pressure is the reason why People often have headaches when they have sinusitis. Does that make sense? Now, as we discussed, the nasal cavity opens into the pharynx. We talked before about this structure. It's a tube made of the skeletal muscle with three areas, the nasopharynx which serves entirely for the passage of air and blind with a pseudostratified columnar epithelium, since there is no rubbing involved. Um, uvula closes this part of the pharynx during swallowing. You can see uvula right here. When you swallow, it elevates and prevents food from getting into the nasal cavity. Nasopharynx contains pharyngeal tonsils or adenoids. And they often get severely inflamed, you know, in case of chronic infections. And then tonsillectomy is performed removing adenoids. Um, it's not that terrible big of a deal. Now, pharyngotympanic tube opens up right here into the nasopharynx, providing a connection between the middle ear and 
the respiratory system, allowing to equalize the pressure between the middle ear and the environment. Now, as we descend from nasopharynx into the oropharynx right here, the type of epithelium that lines the mucosa changes. Now it is stratified squamous epithelium, since oropharynx is the passageway not only for air, but for food as well. Two types of tonsils, palatine tonsils and lingual tonsil, can be found. So palatine tonsil and lingual tonsil can be found in the oropharynx. As we descend further, we enter the laryngopharynx. So laryngopharynx also provides a patent passage for food and air lined with stratified squamous epithelium. And you can see that from laryngopharynx there are two passageways. One leads into the larynx and further into the trachea. And another one leads into the esophagus. And this passageway is for the air. And this path passageway is for the food. As you may remember from our previous discussions related to gastrointestinal system, digestive system, the valve that separates air from the food, that allows the food to get into the esophagus but not in the larynx, is this valve. Sorry, not this valve, I'm sorry. This valve here called epiglottis. It descends down during swallowing and allows food to bypass the larynx and get directly into the esophagus. Does that make sense? So once air went through the nasal cavity, nasopharynx, oropharynx, and laryngopharynx, it enters into the chamber called larynx. Larynx is attached to the hyoid bone, which is quite fascinating bone, as you know. It is the only bone in the human body that is that does not articulate with any other bone. It's basically hanging up in the air. Well, not in the air, in the tissue. Okay. So, if you would look at the connections of larynx, you see that it has a connection with laryngopharynx here and with trachea inferiorly. The main function. So there are a few functions to the larynx. Number one separate food and air. So food goes into the esophagus, air goes into the trachea. Function number two is to produce voice. Now, this part here is still lined with a stratified squamous epithelium since it can get in contact with the food material. Does that make sense so far? Now, below the vocal cords right here, this part of larynx is now lined with a columnar epithelium, pseudostratified columnar epithelium, because that's the part, this one part, that I color red, that only gets in contact normally with air. So larynx is largely composed of the cartilages. So the biggest ones are thyroid and cricoid. Here you can see a almost circular thyroid cartilage, which you can actually touch. It's your Adam's apple. Growth of thyroid cartilage is stimulated by testosterone, 
this is why this part is often more prominent in men than in women. Now, cricoid cartilage forms the posterior wall of the larynx, and it's ring-shaped, as you can see, it gets wider in the back and narrower, narrower in the front. Now, in addition to this two cartilage, thyroid and cricoid, there are three paired cartilages. A retinoid cartilage, corniculate cartilage, and cuneiform cartilage. And the function of this three paired cartilages to control movement, your vocal cords, to regulate the speech production. Does that make sense? Now, these eight cartilages, precoid, thyroid, retinoid, craniculate, and cuneiform, are all hyaline cartilage. Epiglottis, on the other hand, is elastic. Bless you. So far, we're good. Now, let's talk about the voice production. So, this is the organization of your, say, voice producting parts, okay? So, these white structures here, made up of connective tissue, it's basically ligament, these are called true vocal cords or vocal folds. They actually produce the sound. Okay? The space between them, this space that I'm going to cover in red, it is called glottis. So in the right picture, glottis is open. On the left picture, glottis is closed. In the left picture, you cannot produce the sound. On the right, you can. Does that make sense? Now, the folds next to them, these ones, or these ones, these are called vestibular folds or false vocal cords. So the function is to close the glottis when you swallow, so no food accidentally gets aspirated into the lungs. So how do you produce the sound? Um, like you produce the sound when you, when something blows it on the tightly, um, on the tight rope, when you expel the air from your lungs, expelled air starts to vibrate the vocal folds. Does that make sense? The ligaments. And that vibration produces the sound of your voice. Okay? So, what determines the pitch? It's a length and tension. So, can you regulate your pitch? Absolutely. Okay? Can you regulate it to an unlimited degree? No. Because the length of your vocal cords is largely predetermined by genetics. When uh, men well, not men, when uh, teenagers start to grow, they have puberty, testosterone levels increase, uh, vocal folds length increases, and, and they, become, they become thicker, and that is responsible for lowering the voice. That makes sense? You may have heard about the practice that was widely used in uh, Asia to remove the testicles of children with angelic voice, so the voice will get preserved. It is true, it's going to work, because if testicles are removed before puberty, there's no testosterone production, and those vocal folds uh, stay unaffected. And, you know, it's going to be the same voice. Does that make sense? Now, oh, loudness, obviously, is how strongly you expel the air. You know, that, you know, when you 
try to speak loud, it takes a lot of effort because you have to force the air out of your lungs. Does that make sense? And when you really have to scream very, very loud, you have to use not only diaphragm, not only your intercostals, but also your abdominal muscles, sometimes even like cringe over to expel as much air from your lungs as you can. What I want to highlight that <clears throat> the sound has nothing to do with the language. We are just one of the very many animals that can produce sound. But we are, as far as I know, the only animals that can actually produce language, speech. Okay? So, our ability to vocalize depends on the vocal cords. Our ability to talk depends on the tongue, cheeks, lips, you know, all these parts of the mouth. Does that make sense? Got it? So the person that cannot properly operate tongue or lips or produce words can still produce sounds. Okay. Now another interesting feature of vocal folds is they can close glottis and prevent the expulsion of air from the lungs. Does that make sense to you? So in the picture to the left, for instance, no air can leave the lungs because glottis is closed. Okay? This is called a Valsalva's maneuver. So what essentially happens in Valsalva's maneuver, you close the glottis, simultaneously trying to expel the air. As you move, try to move the air out of the lungs unsuccessfully, that significantly increases intrathoracic and intra-abdominal pressure. Increased intra-abdominal pressure is required, for instance, when somebody is constipated, trying to push the feces out. Does that make sense? You understand what I'm saying? Another sort of application of Valsalva's maneuver is weightlifting. Those of you who um, have tried to lift something heavy, you know that you often have to take a deep breath and then you basically try to expel air. It's largely, it's unconscious idea. So you're not like consciously closing your glottis or something, but you feel how the pressure builds up in your chest and your abdomen, stabilizing the trunk, allowing you to lift something heavy. And you also know that if in this situation somebody will, you know, tell you something funny and you will start laughing, you will definitely going to drop this way. Because no stabilization anymore, you cannot just hold it physically. Does that make sense? So Valsalva's maneuver is possible because of this tiny little vocal folds. As we go through the larynx and we go past the vocal folds, we enter the trachea right here, rather small one, called the windpipe. Inside it is covered with the mucosa, again ciliated. So you see cilia of the trachea, cilia here, ciliated pseudostratified columnar epithelium with goblet cells like this one, produces mucus, mucus traps debris and whatever uh, manages to get through the nasal cavity and the pharynx. And cilia synchronously beating moves the mucus upwards towards the point of merging between the larynx and the pharynx. So essentially that contaminated cilia uh, gets up 
and you swallow it. Contaminated silly. Contaminated mucus is lifted up. Contaminated mucus is lifted up. You swallow it. It gets into the stomach where, you know, acid kills everything. In submucosa, you're going to find some submucous glands. Okay. Produce mucus and serous secretions. And then um, it is encased into the C-shaped cartilage, the thyroid cartilage. Does that make sense? That hyaline cartilage actually provides a pretty solid structure for your trachea. You can touch your trachea right here and you can feel it. Okay? It's pretty solid and uh, not really collapsible, which is important because you don't want the windpipe to collapse when you breathe. And this cartilage provides a pretty solid structural framework. Now, uh, there's no muscular layer in the trachea. So you've got mucosa, submucosa, cartilage, and the layer of adventitia, the connective tissue on the outside. Now, can it move your trachea? Can it contract? The answer is yes. If you would look at the cross section, you'll notice that in the posterior aspect, the posterior wall of the trachea, there is a trachealis muscle. Trachealis muscle can contract, causing cough, which will expel the mucus from the trachea and Contractions of the trachealis muscle can be triggered by any kind of irritation due to some dust or anything else that landed on the tracheal mucosa. So far, does that make sense? The end of the trachea, which is not clearly seen on this skin, but right about here, the very end is called a carina. Okay? Carina marks the place where the sensitivity is extremely high. When anything lands on that area around the carina, you produce pretty significant, pretty strong cough to remove that irritant before it can actually reach into the bronchi. So we're going to go through the entire bronchial tree and then, first of all, ask me any questions. And interrupt me but this is kind of a pretty easy flow as we go from trachea now we enter the bronchi so here on this image you can see trachea carina and you see the trachea branching into the left and right primary or main bronchi each primary bronchus enters the hilum of the lung. And upon the entry, look at this. Primary bronchus branches into the secondary. Okay? The secondary bronchi called lobar. Because they deliver, they enable ventilation a single lobe of the lung. For instance, this will be the middle lobar bronchus. This will be all the way down the inferior, and this will supply the air to the superior lung. Same goes here, so that's one bronchial tree that is derived from the lobar bronchus, and this is another lobar bronchus. No wonder we call the bronchial system a bronchial tree. Now, lower bronchi branch into tertiary or segmental bronchi, which supply the bronchopulmonary segments. So that would be segmental bronchus. Okay, um, those will be segmental bronchi. This and this and this will be segmental. So far, you with me? The bronchial tree undergoes 23 orders of division. 
So you have primary, and secondary, and tertiary, and quaternary, then I don't know the proper numerical word for it, but it keeps dividing. Bronchi, as they keep dividing, they become smaller and smaller in diameter. So the smallest bronchi, the bronchioles, are less than one millimeter in diameter. If you're not used to metric system, take a penny, look at it from the side. That's one millimeter. Okay. The smallest bronchioles are terminal. They are right before the respiratory zone starts. And they're less than half millimeter in diameter. They're really, really tiny. Now, what kind of changes occurs throughout the farther dividing bronchial tree? Well, in addition to the fact that bronchi become narrower and narrower, smaller and smaller in diameter, Another really important change occurs. Cartilage rings become replaced by elastic fibers, making those bronchi more stretchable. Epithelium changes from columnar to cuboidal, and not so much mucus is produced anymore, which makes perfect sense because. Think about this. If you have a pretty significant tube, a pretty wide tube, which has a bit of a mucus on the surface, it's okay. If you have a tube with a diameter of one millimeter and there is mucus produced, this mucus is going to completely clog that tube. Does that make sense? So no mucus in the in the branching bronchi, bronchioles, I'm sorry. And not most important, but Last but not least, amount of smooth muscle progressively increases. So if you look at the trachea or primary bronchi, you will not find smooth muscles. Remember, uh, now for a second, let's try to parallel it to the arterial, circula arterial part of the circulation. Remember we talked about three main types of arteries. Elastic, muscular, and arterioles. And the most notable vasomotor responses were seen in arterioles. They managed to constrict and dilate significantly. Make sense? Same happens in the bronchi. Smaller bronchioles can constrict and dilate, allowing you to regulate the flow of gas in or out specific parts of the lung. Are we clear about that? Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? And in fact, unwanted constriction of bronchioles it will lead to anaphylactic shock when people start to suffocate during the asthma attack. Which finally brings us <coughs> to the respiratory zone. So we went from trachea to primary bronchi through all the divisions reaching terminal bronchioles with the smallest diameter, 0.5 millimeters. This is the terminal bronchiole right here. You see the bands of the smooth muscle? And terminal bronchiole will branch into the respiratory ones. And that's respiratory bronchioles is the start of the respiratory zone. So the respiratory bronchiole will branch even further into the alveolar ducts. Okay. And at the end of each alveolar duct, you will see the structures that remind bunches of grapes. These are called alveoli, organized in alveolar sacs. So let's identify this 
and this and this are individual alveoli. This or this or this. All these individual chambers, should I say, are alveoli. And the whole bunch of those chambers, this whole structure, <clears throat> it's the alveolar sac. It's the site of the gas exchange. <coughs> alveoli connected to each other by alveolar pores. You can see alveolar pores in the image to the right. These openings allow the free gas exchange between alveoli, essentially equalizing the pressure in different alveoli, allowing the lung to inflate and deflate um, in synchrony. Now, if you would look at the picture in the right upper corner, you will see that alveoli are surrounded by the capillaries. Those are capillaries, the pulmonary circuit, we call them pulmonary capillaries. So essentially what happens in alveoli is air enters the alveolus, and then there is a gas exchange between the alveolus and the blood in the capillary. Does that make sense? Yes. Say it one more time. It's a good question, and you'd be surprised to know that if you would compare the concentration of... So, the word higher implies higher than somewhere else. So, if you would compare the concentration of oxygen in the lungs to the concentration of oxygen in the tissues, then the answer is yes, of course. Oxygen concentration in the lungs is higher. Then tissues, and this is why blood gets there to pick up oxygen. Does that make sense? But if you would compare, as we will see, the concentration of oxygen in the lungs and the concentration of oxygen in the atmospheric air, lungs actually have a lower concentration of oxygen than the air. Any ideas why? why there is a little less oxygen, concentration-wise. Say again? Say again? Exactly, yes. So basically you have two processes going back and forth in one place. You have oxygen going in, CO2 going out. So basically the air that you inhale mixes with the air, well, air, the gas that leaves your blood. And that gas is practically CO2. Does that make sense? So you're going to see much more CO2 in the lungs than in the air and a little bit less oxygen in the lungs than in the air. Does that make sense to you? So, we're getting as small as one can think of. We're going to be talking about respiratory membrane now. The definition of the respiratory membrane is it's the wall between the alveolus and the blood vessel, the capillary. So, respiratory membrane on that right upper picture is here. So, this is the respiratory membrane. It essentially consists of, well, three parts, uh, two parts. I'm not really good at counting parts, but if you think about it, look at this. So that's alveolar cell, okay? Simple squamous. This is endothelial cell, also simple squamous. And this is basement membrane between them. So basement membranes of these two epithelial layers are actually fused. And simple squamous cells are really, really flat. Does that make sense? 
So you have three very flat structures forming a respiratory membrane, which makes it exquisitely thin, less than one micrometer. If you want some weird comparison, it's basically 100 times thinner than the human hair. So gas exchange through such thin membrane occurs extremely rapidly. We're clear? Good? Now let's, let's see what alveolus consists of. First and foremost, simple squamous cells, like the ones that I highlight, are called type 1 alveolar cells. Their function is structural, they form a respiratory membrane. Now the green type 2 alveolar cells secrete surfactant. It's probably the most important part. They also secrete some antimicrobial proteins, but surfactant is critical. And then there are alveolar macrophages. If something gets through the vibrissae and mucus in your nasal cavity, cilia and mucus in your trachea, and eventually ends up in the lungs, alveolar macrophages should take care of it and should destroy it. Um, actually, there is a there's a book, a really nice book for kids, uh, written by an actual doctor. Her name is Carol Donner. Uh, we can. Google it during the break, I, I can show you. You can buy it, it's pretty rare because they didn't republish it. Uh, it's basically a human anatomy for kids. And it's written in a very fascinating way when two children get much smaller, okay, like shrinked, it's a magic event, and they end up in the human body together with their cat. And I read it when I was a kid, it was, it's a great book, very fun. It, it's, a, it's a kind of a how you tell, tell, tell it? The road movie, road story, you know, they travel. So they try to find a cat inside a human body. And one moment when they finally get a hold of that cat, uh, they meeting an alveolar macrophage that tries to kill the cat because cat is not supposed to be there and tries to kill them as well. Because that's the function of alveolar macrophage. Just move around and clear lungs of anything that is not belonging <clears throat> Does that make sense? So, think about, let me go back for a second. These are alveoli, right? You see how they all bunching up and they are all circular. So there's an enormous surface area. Huge. Okay. So gas exchange is really efficient in the alveoli due to that enormous surface area. So what can impede, what can impair that gas exchange? Well, first, reduced surface area, right? Reduced surface area in the alveoli, what does that mean from clinical perspective? How can you reduce surface area of the alveoli? That's going to be different. That's going to be thickness. Because if fluid accumulates, you refer to, like, say, say you have mucus, you have fluid, that makes the distance that gases have to cross much bigger, yes? Asthma is a different type of problem. You just don't get enough air. I'm talking about the exchange. You just destroy alveoli. You see what I'm saying? So imagine, imagine that you have this. So those are alveoli. You see what I'm saying? Now imagine you do something. This parts, partially walls, get destroyed. So surface of this alveoli becomes smaller and smaller. And that actually happens in the diseases like emphysema. Smoking destroys, directly destroys alveoli. 
Does that make sense? Uh, pulmonary edema due to the left side failure leads to impaired gas exchange and people are short of breath. Does that make sense to you? So let's talk a little bit about the structure of the lungs. Um, so right lung. This is the left lung. And the root of the lung is where it attaches to the mediastinum, basically here. That's the root of, roots of the lungs. And the costal surface will be the part of the lung that faces the ribs. Okay, so that's the costal surface. Okay. Now lungs uh, consist largely of very elastic connective tissue. We call it strola. When we um, remember we inflated the lungs. What you saw inflating, like see on the outside, that was strong. That's not respiratory structure, just the structural part. Top of the lung, here, it's an apex. And the base of the lung faces the diaphragm, it's the base. I mentioned the word hilum. So this is hilum and this is hilum. This part of the lung right here will be a hilum of the lung. And this will be a hilum of the lung. Hilum is the place where blood vessels, uh, bronchi, nerves enter the lung. We're good? Few comparisons. Left lung. Smaller than the right. Because there is a heart on the left and it takes up some space. So you can see here that depression in the left lung is called a cardiac notch. Okay. Left lung being smaller is divided into two lobes. The superior and inferior lobe separated by oblique fissure. So here you can see the superior and inferior lobe separated by the oblique fissure. The right lung has three lobes, superior, middle, and inferior lobe, separated by the top one is called horizontal fissure, and bottom one is oblique. So superior and middle are separated by the horizontal fissure, and then fear and middle is separated by oblique. You can see three lobes, superior, middle, inferior, oblique fissure, horizontal fissure. Does that make sense? Each lung is further separated into bronchopulmonary segments. Now bronchopulmonary segments, you can see on this model that I hold in my hands, those are different bronchopulmonary segments. We call them this way because they are actually physically separated. In this photograph in the right bottom side of the slide, you can see individual bronchopulmonary segments colored, like this green one or these yellow ones. And then if you go farther in terms of the divisions, the smallest part of the lung that is visible to a naked eye is called the lung lobule. Okay. It's served not by bronchi anymore, it's bronchioles. Really small lobules. So each lung is surrounded by the serous membrane called pleura. 
So here on this transverse section, we're going to look at the right lung. You see the serous membrane clinging to the surface of the lung. And this part of the pleuris called, as you all know, visceral. Something that attaches to the organ is visceral pleura. And then the walls of the cavity are surrounded and laid by a parietal pleura. Now, if you look at this image, you'll notice that there is a very fine space between the visceral and parietal pleura. Can you see that space? Can you see that? This is called pleural cavity. You understand? Pleural cavity is filled with fluid, which prevents rubbing of visceral pleura versus parietal pleura and inflammation of the pleural cavity leads to a condition known as pleuritis. Accumulation of the pleural fluid in the pleural cavity will lead to impaired breathing. Does that make sense? Now, um, one really important story that I wanted to mention is the blood supply. Before we move on into the blood supply, a few really stupid questions that I want to ask you. What do we need blood supply to organs for? Oxygen. Very good. First of all, I mean, nutrients, yes. Uh, and the hormones, yes, but oxygen, right? Do you need to supply any oxygen-rich blood alveoli. No. They're full with oxygen, right? That's where the oxygen is. Does that make sense? So what you need the blood supply to is actual lung tissue, the lung stroma. Does that make sense? So there are two types, <clears throat> I'm sorry, of blood vessels that supply and drain the blood to an supply to and drain from the lungs. One circuit you are very familiar with, it's a pulmonary circuit, you can see the uh, this blue colored pulmonary trunk right here and pulmonary arteries right there. Okay, we good? And then of course, you know, you have pulmonary veins that drain oxygen-rich blood from the lungs. Make sense? It has nothing to do with the lung tissue. Because lung tissue receives the blood from the bronchial arteries. So bronchial arteries supply oxygen to all non-alveolar structures of the lung. And then bronchial veins will take the blood, deoxygenated blood, from the lung structure, like, like lung tissue, non-alveolar tissue, and they will, bronchial, or other, bronchial veins will dump the blood into the pulmonary veins. Now, if you think about it, what is the, think about the lungs for a second. Are there a lot of muscles there? In the lungs. There's some amount of smooth muscles, but not a lot. Basically, lungs are gigantic bags that inflate and deflate due to the movement of the chest muscles. Does that make sense? They don't do a lot of things by themselves, so they are not really metabolically demanding organs, meaning they're not going to produce a lot of carbon dioxide or any other waste, so you can easily deliver the blood from there's not going to be a lot of blood supply to the lung tissue. It doesn't require a lot. Does that make sense to you? I'm talking about systemic circuit. I'm talking about bronchial arteries and veins. Are we clear? Now, 
we're getting into some hardcore physics. Not really hardcore. But What I want you to do when we talk about the pressures, and I will try to make it a dialogue so you can understand this better. I want you to not get too hung up on the pictures and schematics and think about breathing the pulmonary ventilation from your own perspective as a human. Something that you really need to focus on are the names for the pressures. And the quantitative relationships. But we will get through this. So first, <clears throat> let's define what the pulmonary ventilation is. This is the process in which respiratory gases enter and leave the lungs. Are clear? So these gases, where do they enter from and where do they leave to? It's the same place. The atmosphere, right? Is that clear? So the process of getting the gas into the lungs is called inspiration. The process of expulsion of gases is called expiration. Now from now on we need to talk about the pressure. And <clears throat> we will refer so all the pressures as being normal at the sea level. So at the sea level, normal atmospheric pressure is 660 millimeters of mercury. If you don't mind, I'm gonna not I'm not gonna use millimeters of mercury anymore. Just the numbers, okay? Because all units are millimeters of mercury. Good? Okay. Now, the respiratory pressure, <clears throat> I'm sorry, is the pressure somehow associated with lungs. <clears throat> respiratory pressure is considered to be negative if it's lower than atmospheric. Positive if it's higher than atmospheric. And zero if it's equivalent <clears throat> to atmospheric pressure. Does that make sense? <clears throat> now, let's define the pressures that are associated with the lung. First, intrapulmonary pressure, pressure inside the alveoli. Or, as we sometimes will say, pressure in your lungs. Does that make sense? Now, let me ask you this. If you have an atmosphere, an atmosphere, give a lung, and the pressure in the atmosphere and the lung are the same, if they are equal, if respiratory pressure is zero, is there going to be any airflow between the atmosphere and the lungs? Is that understood mechanically? You understand that if the pressure is outside and the in the lung the same, there's no airflow. Good? Second pressure, which is called intrapleural. Intrapleural pressure is the pressure in the pleural cavity. It is always negative. So pressure in the pleural cavity is again we're talking normal <clears throat> always lower than the atmospheric pressure and intrapulmonary pressure now let me ask you this look at the lung the left lung in this case now the pressure inside of the lung is zero the intra, um, intrapleural pressure is negative 4. Which one is bigger? 
zero. The zero is bigger than negative four, right? So that pressure inside of the lung is higher than in the pleural cavity, meaning that the lung stays inflated. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Now, the difference between intrapulmonary and intrapleural pressure is called the transpulmonary pressure. So in the picture here, in the example here, it's again negative four. It can fluctuate and fluctuates with breathing. Okay. The greater the difference, the bigger the lungs. Now, think about this for a second. Just, just hold on a second before we move on. About transpulmonary pressure. So say your intrapleural is negative four. All right, you with me? It's negative four. And you start pumping air into your lungs. What's going to happen to your intrapulmonary pressure? It's going to go up. So let's say it's not zero, but say it's now one or two. So transpulmonary pressure will not be negative four. It's going to be, sorry, not going to be four. It's going to be six. It's going to be larger. Does that make sense, the difference? And that bigger pressure, it's kind of obvious. That's what makes your lungs bigger when you inhale. Make sense, right? The bigger lungs, the bigger transpulmonary pressure. So the transpulmonary essentially is going to always be positive. Yeah. Well, norm. Okay, in the normal physiologically healthy conditions, yes. Because we're gonna we're gonna talk about what happens if it's not positive. Okay, but it's positive. Lungs are inflated. Does that make sense? Now, again, this is okay, that will work. So, what makes the intrapleural pressure the pressure in the pleural cavity, what makes this pressure negative? And it turns out two main things. First, lungs, those two balloons, are elastic. And as any balloon, they always attempt to recoil. Does that make sense? As they attempt to recoil, and the lung attempts to get smaller in size, <clears throat> the pressure in the cavity will go down. Another factor that contributes to recoil of the lungs is surface tension, the alveolar fluid. Now, remember our experiment with lung pumping. Remember? What happened to the lungs as soon as we pulled the uh, hose out? They deflated. Well, nobody was deflating them, right? They were just collapsing because of their own elasticity. Like a soccer ball or, I don't know, beach ball that you can inflate, but if you will put the plug out, it will start deflating just because it is elastic. Does that make sense? Another contributor, especially when you inhale, <clears throat> to the low intrapleural pressure is expanding of the thorax. So basically, if you look at my hands, look at my hands. My left hand represents the thoracic wall. My right hand represents the wall of the lung. Wall of the lung tries to go this way, right? And thoracic wall goes that way when you expand it with muscles. So you kind of spread the boundaries of your pleural cavity, increasing its volume and 
immediately drop in the price. That makes sense? Like you sucking something out. You increase the volume, like a plunger in the syringe. You increase the volume and that takes in the air because the pressure drops. Good? Now, back to Aaron's question. What if transpulmonary pressure not positive anymore? Okay? What happens? So say transpulmonary pressure depends on the intrapleural, right? So say your um, intrapulmonary pressure, this one, still zero, it's atmospheric, right? And then you take a, a, a pretty significant needle and you poke a hole in the pleural cavity, allowing atmospheric air to get into. So if when atmospheric air gets into the pleural cavity, what's going to be the pressure in the pleural cavity? What exactly? Atmospheric air gets in the pleural cavity. The pressure will be number. Number. Atmospheric. It will be equalized with atmosphere, right? So it's going to be 760. Does that make sense? So 760 here, and we already figured out, you're not breathing yet, so 760 here. The pressure is in the lung and in the pleural cavity, if you poke the pleural cavity, will be the same. Does that make sense? And we also figured lung is elastic and tries to recoil. If transpulmonary pressure is zero, uh, yeah, if it is zero, then lung will start collapsing because of its own elasticity, okay? We call it pneumothorax. That make sense? I, I'm looking at Julia because I know that if the person worked in EMT, you dealt with it, hundred percent. What's the treatment? Uh, in the field. Or not? In the field. Hmm. So you, you basically stick a large bull needle into the pleural cavity to try and weasel things out and then you're gonna use positive pressure ventilation to increase the volume. Yes. And in the hospital it's gonna be a chest tube. Yes. So yes. I have a question. Yes. I've seen like I've seen TV shows. What is the point of what intercostal spaces? So basically that basically the idea is either to make pressures equal and then just inflate the lung from the ventilator, right? Or uh, one option that is also viable is to try and just suck the air out. Okay? If you can plug the hole and then suck the air out, it's possible. And actually um, I listened to a talk by an emergency medicine doctor who answered the very common question so you plug the hole there is no exchange of the air between the there's no exchange of air between the atmosphere and the pleural cavity so there's no exchange here okay how can you reinflate the lung by sucking the air out you're still poking a needle the answer is when you use a needle and you suck the air out and you pull it out, tissues will block the air. I don't know how to explain. So they will kind of squeeze that hole and the hole will become non-existent because it's so small. Okay. But basically the idea is to, ideally, to remove the air from the pleural cavity. And that will reinflate the lung. Another reason why lung can collapse, accumulation of fluid in the pleural cavity. It will just increase pressure 
without any poking. Does that make sense? And also what can happen if bronchioles are severely plugged, say with mucus, there is no air coming into the lung. Air in the lung gets absorbed by the blood, which drops the intrapulmonary pressure. Intrapulmonary pressure decreases, eventually equalizes with intrapleural pressure, lung collapses. Does that make sense? That's pretty common. Actually, yeah. Uh, we did uh, pneumothorax when I was working with mice. Uh, we had a protocol of sacrificing mice. And you have a certain procedure because it was terminal surgery. There is a certain procedure how you sacrifice a mouse. Okay. And they were anest properly anesthetized and everything. But our procedure name was named exsanguination and pneumothorax. So basically, first you stick a needle into the heart and you suck as much blood as you can. And then you open up the chest and it's just you open up the chest the moment the moment you make a cut like the first moment you can peek into the chest of the mouse lungs are flat completely flat what you saw with a pig not even comparable just flat they look like two tiny white flat things i don't know because Pressure is equalized. Okay. So, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about inspiration and expiration and pressure changes, and then we're going to take a break. Because that would be just logical here. Um, so, two things, really? Thing number one, gas goes from higher pressure to the lower pressure. Does that make sense? Always. Does that make sense to you? From higher to lower pressure? Like when inflated tire, if you remove the nipple, the air will come out. Does that make sense? And second, pressure changes will follow the volume changes. That's kind of it. So this relationship, also called, called the Boyle's Law, shows you the relationship between pressures and volumes in a closed chamber. Now, how does it apply to the inspiration? When you inspire, diaphragm contracts and the bottom of your thoracic cavity descends. Does that make sense? Intercostals contract and your chest expands. We're clear? So overall, during inhalation, your chest volume, thoracic volume increases. Does that make sense? Now, if volume increases what happens to the pressure it decreases so intrapulmonary pressure pressure inside your lungs decreases and it becomes one millimeter lower than the pressure in the environment air is going where yeah into your lungs something like this look at these balloons so i'm going to increase so that can represents the thoracic cavity and those balloons represent the lungs. Okay, so yeah, I increase the volume, lungs inflate. Make sense? That's inspiration. And the inhalation will happen until the pressures are equalized. So normally, when you are not breathing or at the peak of inspiration, think about this, at the peak of inspiration, when there is no air movement, the pressure in the environment and the pressure in the lungs are the same. Is that clear? Now, if these muscles are not enough in like exercise or in pulmonary diseases or if they are affected by poliomyelitis, 
accessory muscles like pectoralis minor or scalene. There's a term actually, scalene breathing. Okay, it's a special technique that has been taught to people with polio that allow, who had intercostals or diaphragm paralyzed that allowed them to kind of survive for some time without the machine called iron lung. Have you heard about this machine? Basically, it's a pump that moves your chest. Does that make sense? Now, in expiration, muscles of inspiration, diaphragm, and intercostals relax. So they relax, the volume of thoracic cavity decreases, and volume decreases, intrapulmonary pressure, intrapulmonary volume decreases, pressure goes up. It becomes higher than atmospheric and the air gets out of the lungs. Does that make sense? Now look at this demonstration again. So this is inspiration. I increase the volume of thoracic cavity that decreases intrapulmonary pressure in these balloons and the air flows into them. Does that make sense? Do I do something for it? It's a simple question. Do I do something? Yeah. It's an active process. Does that make sense? So I apply some force. What do I need to exhale? So to say. Just release my fingers. So inhalation is the active process. Exhalation is passive. Does that make sense? To inhale, muscles have to contract. It's active. To exhale, all you need to do is to relax. Now, what if I need to really exhale? Like this. Do I use muscles? Yeah. You use internal intercostals. You use transversus abdominis. Use obliques. So, I additionally increase the pressure in my abdominal cavity, which will force the air out of my lungs. Now let's go over the summary of the pressures once again. So this graph shows you the changes in the intrapulmonary and intrapleural pressure over time. So think about this. When you inhale, when you inspire, what happens to your chest volume? It increases. What happens to intrapulmonary pressure, the pressure inside of your lungs? It decreases, yeah, right here. And your intrapleural pressure, because the chest wall goes outward, decreases as well. Does that make sense? So in fact, your transpulmonary pressure rises. And then as you exhale, what happens to the volume of your thoracic cavity? Goes down. The pressure inside of thoracic cavity goes up. And intrapleural pressure inside of the pleural cavity goes up. Does that make sense? And that forces the air out of the lungs. So, we're going to take a...